Why do the wicked seem to succeed? Well, that's a question that many people ask, and we'll look at that today from Job chapter 21 as Job also asked that question. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Wherever you are, my name is Rodham. I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV Quick Study. We take you through the Bible from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. We do that every year. And it's exciting. Corey is here to help us. Corey, what's up? Well, let's just say today that we're going to be taking a look at a very practical aspect of ancient life. Very practical aspect hmm. of ancient life. I know what she's talking about. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is interesting. So what are you doing? Today I'm going to be talking about <laughs> mocking. Okay, very good. And Ryan is here. Ryan, what's up, brother? Is the Bible just a book of fairy tales and fantasies? After all, the Bible in books like Job mentions unicorns. More on that later. Unicorns, really? That's interesting. All right. We'll talk about that and we'll get your Bible guide out. It is time to study Job. Job chapter 21, verses 1 through 14. Then Job answered and said, Listen carefully to my speech and let this be your consolation. Bear with me that I may speak, and after I have spoken, keep mocking. As for me, is my complaint against man? And if it were, why should I not be impatient? Look at me and be astonished. Put your hand over your mouth. Even when I remember I am terrified and trembling takes hold of my flesh. Why do the wicked live and become old, yes, become mighty in power? Their descendants are established with them in their sight, and their offspring before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear, neither is the rod of God upon them. Their bull breeds without failure, their cow calves without miscarriage. They send forth their little ones like a flock, and their children dance. They sing to the tambourine and harp, and rejoice to the sound of the flute. They spend their days in wealth, and in a moment go down to the grave. Yet they say to God, Depart from us, for we do not desire the knowledge of your ways. Job chapter 21, verses 1 through 14. Too often we see the success of the wicked and judge God for his lack of judgment on them. Well, it's easy, even in the natural, for us to focus on what we can see about our lives and about the lives of others, and then judge everything based on that. But in our lives, there is a lot of context that we do not see unless we're looking for it, and even some context that may be impossible for us to see. And that is the problem with Job, except that he is suffering terribly. Now, the men surrounding him are hacking at him and there is no justice in his understanding of what's happening. He's lost everything, and almost everyone is now suffering a horrible life. This is amazing. But the story is not yet over. As with our lives, the story extends beyond life now into the afterlife. And the Bible explains that our best life is not now, but it is with God in eternity. For if we prepared for that, and we have something to look forward to. Jesus Christ did the work. We just need to say to Jesus Christ, yes, Lord, come into my life, come into my heart, and be the Lord of my life. Very important. As we continue to study on in the book of Job, we learn some critical things. And I can tell you that there are times in television when we see very many displays, and we can see it on Netflix, or we can see it on wherever you get your movies, and you can see displayed evil succeed. And every once in a while, good succeeds, and that makes a good story. Now, this is important because as we turn to this today, we need to think this through because that's what Job is talking about. If you don't have a Bible guide, why not? Write to us and get a Bible guide. We'd be happy to send it to you. You can use the addresses at the bottom of the screen and you can write to us and say, I'd like to get a Bible guide. Just remember this, that uh, an offering in any amount would help us tremendously. And let me say that uh, you can make an offering or if you want to partner with us, that is give regularly whatever the amount is 
Thank you so much. That helps tremendously as well. And you can just give if you want to help us out. You don't have to get the Bible guide, but if you just want to help us out, you can give and that would be tremendously helpful. You can also go to www.biblediscoverytv.com and give there. Go to donate, make a donation. It'll take you to the pocket guide, the PDF file, and you can ask for a copy as well. We'd be happy to send it to you. Why the wicked succeed? Why do they succeed? They do, it seems. Job 21, 1 to 14, Father, I pray today that you would help us to learn the reality of what's happening here, to learn the reality that no one gets away with anything. No one gets away with anything. That there is a judgment seat of God and that the believer has a judgment seat of Jesus Christ. Help us to understand, Lord, the power of your recognizing everything is done, and then you bring those things done to reconciliation with who you are. In the name of Jesus Christ, and we said together, amen. That's very important because that's in the last book of Revelation. Very interesting. Job 21, 1 to 7 then. Let's go back to Job. Then Job answered, and he said, talking to his friends, listen carefully to my speech and let this be your consolation. Verse three continues, bear with me that I may speak. And after I have spoken, keep mocking. Wow. That's how he saw their help is mocking him. Verse four says, as for me, is my complaint against man? Is it? If it were, why should I not be impatient? Look at me and be astonished, Job says. Put your hand over your mouth. Even when I remember, I am terrified. And trembling takes hold of my flesh. Why do the wicked live and become old? Yes, become mighty in power. This is a stunning speech that Job gives. Remember that Job claims that the wicked seem to succeed. That's what it looks like to Job. But remember, God is not finished with us yet. He's not finished. We cannot see all things now. Beloved, we need to understand that God is doing something and he's allowing us to see that. When we see that, it'll be when our life is over. But God is taking a look at everything that's happening. So there is no injustice with God. Job didn't know that, but he learned it at the end of the chapter. And he learned it in a very powerful way, beloved. And as we look at this, we understand that there's a bigger picture, a gigantic, huge picture. And we need to remember that as believers in Jesus Christ, as people who follow the Lord, we need to understand that God is doing something. Very important. Let's go back to the scripture. Their descendants are established with them in their sight, he continues. And the evil's offspring before their eyes. Verse 9 says, their houses are safe from fear. Neither is the rod of God upon them. He can't explain this. Why? Job claims that the wicked expand in family and friends. They grow and they've done wicked things. But do the friends last forever? Do your friend, do friends last forever? Especially friends who are friends because of money. Does the family have peace? A lot of people say, well, you know, Hollywood has all the money in the world. But does Hollywood have a successful family? Does Hollywood have people who understand each other, who love each other, trust each other, do good to each other? It's a good question. As we look at some of the things going on now, we need to consider that. And we need to think that through, beloved. It's, see, Success is not just in money, but success is in knowing God and letting him respond in your family and letting him grow you and grow me because that's how success comes. The money is part of it, maybe. God has always promised to fulfill our needs, N-E-E-D-S, not our wants, but our needs. And we must remember that. Well, let's get back to the scripture, learn what Job said. Their bull breeds without failure. They're cow calves without miscarriage, he says. They send forth 
their little ones like a flock and their children dance. They sing to the tambourine and to the harp and rejoice to the sound of their flute. They spend their days in wealth and in a moment go down to the grave. Yet they say to God, depart from us, for we do not desire the knowledge of your ways. That's what they say. Job claims that the wicked hate God and have turned away. Listen carefully. We should come to the Lord and not turn away. Don't turn away from God. Jesus Christ extends our life to forever, to eternity. You know, eternity does not fit in your day timer, doesn't fit in there, or any calendar does not have, is not big enough for eternity. It is amazing when you begin to understand that your spirit operates outside of time as well as inside of time. Now we're inside of time, but there comes a time when we operate outside of time. Isn't that something? Beloved, we need to understand, and may I encourage you today to come to know Jesus Christ. Invite, he is the Lord, he is God. Invite him into your life as Lord. He came and he died for your sin. He paid the cost for that sin. And he rose again, miraculously, in the flesh. And then he says, if you invite me into your heart to be Lord of your life, I will change your life. Say, Jesus, come into my life in Jesus' name. Change my life, I need you now. I know you paid for my sin, help me today. In Jesus' name, amen. It's time now to continue on in our Bible discovery, and today's reading is Job chapters 20 through 23. Now, many Bible skeptics have pointed to certain Old Testament passages, one of which is in Job chapter 39, that mention unicorns. This critic says is proof positive that the Bible is just a book of fables and fairy tales. But what did God really say? Let's find out. Many believe that the claimed Word of God, the Bible, is just a book of fairy tales and legends and has no real application or authority for our lives. For example, critics point out nine different passages in the Old Testament which seemingly refer to the mythological unicorn. Indeed, the unicorn is mentioned in the original 1611 King James Version of the Bible, as well as some other versions in other languages. However, there is still much disagreement among Bible scholars today over the meaning of the original Hebrew word. In the original language, the word is re'em. In modern Hebrew, this word means wild ox, and many scholars believe that this is the correct translation. One commentator even notes that when observed closely, the original Hebrew of Deuteronomy 33.17 does not actually allow for re'em to be translated as unicorn. Yet some other scholars have also provided compelling evidence that this ancient word is conveying a single-horned creature, and therefore should be translated as unicorn. Still, even if this is the correct translation, there is no need for Bible students to be troubled. Indeed, Dr. Elizabeth Mitchell observes how quick we are to forget that a single horn feature is not uncommon on God's menu for animal design. Consider the rhinoceros and the narwhal. Furthermore, this creature mentioned in the Bible is clearly not the same as the fanciful one-horned horse-like animal found in ancient Chinese creation mythology, which only gentle maidens can tame. Indeed, the Bible describes an animal that is very strong, that is useless for agricultural work, and unwilling to work for men. An animal that skips like a calf and bleeds when it dies. Additionally, the fact that the unicorn is listed alongside other real animals in the Bible, such as lambs, goats, and donkeys, is evidence that it is referring to a real creature. Those who believe that the Bible is truly describing a one-horned animal have offered a couple of suggestions as to the identification of the creature. One of which is the Elasmotherium, which is an extinct giant rhinoceros. Whatever the case, there is no mistake in the Bible. This creature, whatever it was, was very real, just as is the rest of the Bible's account. So we see here that whatever this animal was, was definitely very real and not so strange. In contrast, the mythical horse-like unicorn isn't to be found anywhere in Scripture. Once again, the Bible demonstrates itself to be a book not only with no real errors, but one that is truly divinely inspired. Corey, what are you studying today? 
Thanks, Ryan. Well, over the next few days in the book of Job, as we study, you and I are going to be taking a look at ancient culture and cultural elements, some practical ways that the people lived in, and we're going to be taking our cues from some of the things that are written in the book of Job, some of the mentions that Job and his friends make to their ancient culture. But today, you and I are going to be focusing in on an issue that often we don't focus on for obvious reasons. We're going to be taking a look at ancient toilets. Have you ever wondered what happened and how ancient people lived? We're gonna find out. A common human issue has always been what to do with everyday human waste. The simplest answer for those living nomadic lifestyles would likely have been a mixture of what humans without modern technology have always done, the digging of holes or the use of chamber pots to collect waste. Evidence shows that humans who lived stationary lives, whether in cities and houses or outside of cities and country villas, had more than just the humble hole or chamber pot. They could create cesspit toilets. These were very much like outhouses. A pit was dug, often lined with plaster to help contain the waste, and then a toilet seat was placed over the hole. Several stone toilet seats have been found in Israel, and famously, two were found still over their cesspits in Jerusalem. These ones were used for some time before the city's destruction by Babylon in 586 BC. As evidenced by samples from these cesspits, liming agents were routinely added to the pits to control bacterial production and aid in the decomposition of waste, though every so often, waste still would have needed to have been removed from the pits. Even from very ancient times, however, more luxurious arrangements are known to have existed. Toilets with running sewer systems. Running water toilets were seats built over top of water pipes that had continuously flowing water to wash away waste, eliminating the inconvenience and probably much of the smell of cesspit toilets. Toilets like these are known from Mesopotamia as far back as the third millennium BC. It wasn't until the time of the Roman Empire that these toilets were made available to the public rather than just the elite. Sometime in the second century BC, Roman public toilets began to be installed widely throughout the empire. They were built in public spaces to serve many at a time. Privacy was maintained more through the floor length garments worn by men and women and less through proximity. These seats were made of stone or wood and were placed over a channel of flowing sewer water to wash away the excrement. A bit later in time, a trench or channel of ever-flowing water was built into the floors of these Roman latrines directly in front of the line of toilet seats. These are believed to have been for the Roman answer to toilet paper, sponges attached to short sticks. So while this is a little bit of an unsavory part of our ancient past and our ancient history, it still is part of ancient technology. Uh, and so culturally, it's very interesting to learn even these practical elements of how ancient people lived. And it wasn't just the Romans who constructed uh, working, uh, flushable, uh, essentially, toilets. Uh, these, this technology has been found uh, in very ancient parts of the world and all over the world as well. So this has been an ongoing human problem <laughs> since the beginning of humans. So it's interesting to see how we've yeah. dealt with it over the millennia. <laughs> you know, it is. And a lot of people don't think about it. But, you know, when you be I remember going to the uh, Middle East and seeing the, uh, I, I guess they were just a series of toilets um, and looking at them and wondering. And they didn't look all that different than a lot of the, the toilets Are you today. talking about I'm Roman talking about the Roman yes. toilets? Yes. Well, and what's so interesting, too, is that they very quickly became standardized in the Roman Empire, uh, and very much like today, where, you know, there's, in, in the Western world, there's a standard image for, you know, a washroom sign, and you go in, and they pretty much all look the same, they work the same. There's a level of comfort in that organization, that centralized government organization of it. Uh, and and Rome knew that too. You know, it's part of human nature. We they knew. Okay, well, we're going to have a standardized system for this, and it's going to work. And it did. If there's <laughs> one thing the Romans did, they standardized things, and they they, they set it up so that people could you know, feel like they were with people. And yes. uh, that, that's really well, interesting. And, and, and a lot of, too, like a lot of people have, you know, when you look at how, you know, some of these uh, public toilets had 50 seats in them, you know, that was rare, that was very large, but they would definitely all have multiple seats, sometimes 10, sometimes 25, sometimes 50. Um, rumors of up to 100 toilet seats, and people, uh, some people go, well... 100? Some people go, well, you know, was this for socializing? What was this 
for. <laughs> and more than likely, it was just very practical because mm -hmm. you had it was built in public centers. It was yeah. built near public buildings. And when you have people in a city, they're going to need to go to the washroom. And if you don't have somewhere for them to go to the washroom, they might just have to go on the street. Nobody wants that, especially the Romans. So, so, it, so it gets it gets messy. So in a sense, this is a well, it is it's very a way to deal publicly mm -hmm. with uh, yeah. you know. It's a good Human thing they problems. were. It's a good thing they were good with water, you know, and yes. their their water systems. Yes, that, that's interesting. I, you know, it's absolutely fascinating. Things you don't think about, you but don't. they were very real issues. Well, they actually they were, and a lot of people think that the sewers were made in the 1800s, 1700s, by the uh, British. But actually, it's it's actually a, an ancient idea that has been in play for a long time. Yeah, so. in ancient Mesopotamia, even they had in, some cities had running water. Ancient China. Yeah, I mean ancient Rome. <laughs> The water it ran differently, but I mean, it, you know, it runs from up down, and so it's really interesting how that all develops. And uh, I just I can't get over a hundred, a hundred. Rumored. I don't think I don't think a hundred cedar has ever been found, but well, there's been fifty good. cedars found. Very very even... interesting one in Jerusalem. I'll tell you about it later. <laughs> the things <laughs> you learn on Bible discovery. No else, folks. Saying. <laughs> just saying. I don't know. Well, you know, we're coming out of Zophar's sermon on the wicked man in chapter 20. And um, Eliphaz earlier suggested that he and his friends were offering Job comfort. But Job may maintained here that Zophar and the others were instead mocking him, as we see him saying, listen carefully to my speech and let this be your consolation. Bear with me that I may speak. And after I have spoken, keep mocking. Now, Zophar had accused Job of mocking or ridiculing them back in chapter 11, verse 3. And what struck me here was that it's easy for us in situations like these men found themselves in to become uncomfortable in a situation and kind of attack one another mm -hmm. because we're feeling uncomfortable. And it's very easy for us to do that. And my point to myself that I made here is that we must pray for one another and have grace with each other. You know, when we come upon uh, a brother or a sister in Christ who are going through a difficult time, anyone, even a non-believer, who's going through a difficult time, that is such a wonderful opportunity for us to be able to extend the grace that Jesus Christ has given to each of us and to ask him to help us to control our emotions, to respond out of love, not out of trying to make ourselves feel better in some way, shape, or form. So that, that's all I wanted to point out today was that um, it, it can be very easy to slip into mockery or being accusatory towards somebody and almost have that pack mentality uh, mm -hmm. when you're around someone. Or if you're in a situation where the person isn't present mm -hmm. and somebody gets talking about them, it's very easy to, to participate in conversations that you never would have but it, 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 it's kind of enticing and you get talking and you get thinking about it. It's good in those situations to be aware when you're slipping into those things. And, 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 and avoid and it and get out of it. And then be a leader and change the subject. Mm -hmm. or, or stop and say, you know what, instead of us talking about it, why don't we just pray? Right now, pray for that person and be a leader in those in those in those situations rather than be accusatory or mm -hmm. mocking towards one another. So, you know, I think it's that's a, all. and that's really important because I think that today, again, we talk about the social media and we talk about everything that we're doing on the Internet at the very unique time that we're in right now. Um, it, it becomes important for us to take leadership and, and say, well, we're not going to participate in that. Somebody knocks somebody or says this or, or you know, I, I don't know how many times I could, if I had a nickel for every time somebody said something about somebody else, mm -hmm. about the president, about the prime minister, but I would be rich. Mm -hmm. And so everybody's throwing things out there and it seems like they're unaccountable. Well, and that's what I was going to say as well. Sorry to interrupt you, but that's exactly what I think social media has done. It is, it's it's a, a, a multiplicity of words without that accountability. It's very easy for me to say something about Rod Hembry over here, but to your face, it's it's different. Very different. Very different. And, and, you know, God is listening to every word. God knows what we're saying and, 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 and what we're thinking. Um, and it, and it's, it's, it's important. Mm. There, there is an accountability. There Our is. words matter. There Our is an accountability. Matter. And there will come a time when God will, and, and the time is soon, 
when God will call us to account. Remember that Hebrews 9.27 says to us, it is appointed. Appointed means it's specifically assigned to you for every person to perish in the physical being and then face judgment. What do you mean then face judgment? Your spirit is not contained by your body anymore. Your body does not contain your spirit anymore, but your spirit is not now free and it's at the judgment seat. So whatever you did will be judged. And it's judgment seat of Jesus Christ for us, not to get to heaven, but what we do with what we were given. And number two, the judgment seat of God. Did we accept Jesus Christ as Lord? Very important that we mm -hmm. remember that. Those both are mentioned in scripture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just want to bring up, if I can, our offer for this month, which is our Galatians sermon series. Now, this sermon series is uh, was taught and preached by you, Dad, Pastor Rod Hembry. And this is a six, uh, six session series. So there are six sermons on here uh, on three discs, three DVDs. Um, one session for each chapter of Galatians. There are also bonus features on each disc just for fun. There's some vintage or retro quick studies on here going back to 2008 and 2009, 10 years ago. Uh, so there's even some fun Bible IQ questions on here. Uh, but if you are interested in studying Galatians and really getting into it, perhaps you have a Bible study or a small group that meets in your home and you're looking for a next session series, may we suggest this one on Galatians. Uh, so if you like to get a hold of your copy, we are offering it for a suggested donation of $60 uh, to the ministry to keep us strong and keep us going and bringing more things to you like this. So call, write to us, go online, get a hold of us and ask for the Galatians Sermon Series.